Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for part two of the Clifford Still Museum's program, Into the Vaults with Dean Sobel. My name is Nicole Cromarty, and I'm the Director of Education and Programs here at the Clifford Still Museum. This afternoon, CSM's Director, Dean Sobel, will lead us on a 45-minute virtual tour into the secret depths of CSM's North Painting Storage Vaults. This is going to be such a special treat. During my first week working at CSM, I got a tour of North Painting Storage, which is where Clifford Still's earlier works are stored, and I teared up. I was overwhelmed to see so many paintings showing the evolution of Still's practice right in front of me. Today's tour is the second installation of this program series following Dean's tour of South Painting Storage earlier this summer. So most of you already have the pleasure of knowing Dean Sobel. CSM director since 2005, Sobel is presently finishing a major exhibition on Still's late works planned to open September 17th, 2020. Thank you for joining us today, Dean. I will turn it over to you. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Can you hear and see me okay? Thumbs up. <laughs> Wonderful. Hey, it's nice to be back in our uh, painting storage areas. Um, as Nicole mentioned, we did one of these just for our uh, Cherish members, oh, probably five or six weeks ago. Uh, but it was so much fun, we wanted to do it again for our larger audience. Um, that members uh, virtual tour was in the other painting storage room, what we call South Painting Storage, where there were mostly uh, large works from the 1960s and 70s. Um, today, we're going to be in North Painting Storage, which as Nicole mentioned, has virtually all of the early works, um, everything before roughly 1955 or so, with a few exceptions. <clears throat> Just a reminder, since we're looking at probably small, generally smaller works, take advantage of that collections.cliffordstillmuseum.org. I'll try to remember to give you the pH number so you can just simply type in the search box the pH number, which for all intents and purposes is the title of these works. And then you'll see a full size image on your computer screen. I can narrate over that and you'll be able to find pretty easily ways to zoom in and look at some of the fine details we're talking about um, in the next 45 minutes. <clears throat> so with that introduction, the first, first group we're looking at are kind of classic subjects and paintings for still in the mid-1930s. These paintings date from 1935 to 1936. We really think of them as a group when we show them in the galleries. Honestly, I think they're somewhat interchangeable. They have many of the same ideas. Uh, certainly a lot of the same stylistic approaches attached to all of them. Um, and as you can tell, they're quite figurative. Um, these are not abstract, at least in a sense that we'll use that term very shortly. <laughs> um, and they all figure, uh, all include farm subjects. Um, as you know, Clifford Still uh, was at this point in uh, Pullman, Washington, uh, in the process of finishing up his master's degree, where he would then hang on to teach as a junior professor, essentially, for the next uh, five or six years until 1941 when the war breaks out. Um, and what's interesting about these uh, subjects is that they all seem of a similar type. Um, there's a lot of uh, question about who these people are. Clifford Still's daughter, and this is a kind of funny thing to say about your family, feels there's a family resemblance in these images. Uh, they're not always uh, positive figures. You know, they're obviously under distress. Um, you'll note the emaciated uh, body types, um, bones and ribs are sticking through the skin, um, sightless eyes, bony skull-like faces. Uh, but that's kind of uniform across all of these figures. Uh, the one I want to focus in on a little bit more specifically is this PH79, a painting that we're actually going to be showing in uh, the fall in the permanent collection galleries. And, you know, obviously it's an image of suffering. Um, so there's something about this image that seems relevant to what we're uh, going through in the present time. Um, I didn't mention it, but of course, we're at the height of the depression here. Uh, if the stock market crash was in 1929, the fact that this depression was lingering on and uh, it just was taking a greater and greater toll the more years and years that the um, economy and the workforce was slipping into this horrible um, period. This may look familiar to you also because it's a fairly common subject for photographers of this time. Uh, people like Dorothea Lane working for the uh, Farm Securities Administration or Walker Evans, some others. Uh, these were very common subjects for American artists. 
And I think that's an important uh, consideration for artists working at this time is they wanted to work in an American idiom. Um, to turn now to PH79, there's so many things about this painting that are noticeable and hopefully you had a chance to take it in uh, just a little bit. Um, the, I guess I'll start with from a compositional standpoint, it has a very strong right angle, horizontal and vertical axis. So this railing is met by the bench that the two figures are resting on. That um, uh, right angle is mirrored by the female figure just to the right. And then this male figure, quite exhausted, um, reclining prone on that woman's uh, uh, lap. So this idea of a very strict right angle is something we do see in Stills landscapes and in certain aspects of Stills work uh, throughout, although we don't think of him as being an artist that interested in geometry. If we look at the color, one of the things that I think this picture and a lot of the paintings have from this time is a kind of coalescing around reds and yellows and blues. Certainly the red and blue are the most obvious, but if you don't see it so well on your computer screen, the background, the painted wood clapboards of the uh, barn, uh, probably a barn, also have this kind of pallid yellow, almost jaundice-like like color. Sickness um, seems to come over the, the whole image. Um, another thing I wanted to bring to your attention, and I have nothing that would suggest I'm right about this, um, but picking up on what um, has been proposed that these could be family members, uh, an extended family um, near Pullman, Washington, this reclining figure has a, a tuft of uh, grayish hair. And you may know that Clifford still turned gray prematurely. Uh, we have a self-portrait from roughly 1940 where he already has that white hair. And I find it rather interesting that this farm worker, uh, shirtless farm worker, is of a, a certain advancing age that his hair might have already turned or started to turn white. Now, not that this is an image of Clifford Still, although I could argue the long face and the brow of the nose has certain resemblances. It's just one of the many puzzling things about this painting uh, when I see it. Um, the other thing you might want to consider is the relationship that a lot of Still's work of this time has to earlier art. Or I could even say that another way, probably all works of art have relationships to earlier art. Um, in this respect, you may find uh, associations with the many images of uh, Christ um, and Mary, the so-called Pieta. I think the male figure uh, has that kind of uh, quality about it, almost death-like as it rests on the um, somewhat comforting female figure on the left. Um, more interesting though, Sandra Still also said that his, uh, her father said that this image was his scream and specifically Edvard Munch's scream, uh, a couple of versions of that painting, but all of them around 1900. Um, although this is obviously a silent scream, it's not that sort of shriek, try in German um, that you would see in a, the, the German expressionist, but it's a much more um, interior view of suffering and this crisis that these figures are going through. Um, two more points that I would make uh, note of. The um, horseshoe seems to be positioned in the unlucky position. There's different um, beliefs about which way you should hang a horseshoe if you're going to do such a thing in your rec room or outside in your patio. Um, but the idea that good fortune could be cupped or held in the horseshoe um, is one probably more a common way people have used the horseshoe image. So in fact, still is showing a certain amount of uh, pessimism. In fact, that only uh, poor luck will be bestowed on these uh, figures. And then on the very left-hand side of the pic picture, uh, picture, sorry, we've been staring at this for years, the somewhat geometric, maybe machine shape that seems to be coming um, out of the frame on the left-hand side, which may be part of a piece of uh, farm machinery or some other aspect that still has left. Um, completely mysterious to us. Um, but a really, really interesting painting and one that again you can see in person uh, starting on September 18th. And hopefully you'll see the way the anatomy and the musculature, uh, the way shoulders are described um, and repeated uh, are going to start to become apparent in his increasingly abstract work when we start talking about things like lifelines. Um, Nicole had mentioned if you've got questions while we're on this image, I'll, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Um, if not, I'll just keep, uh, keep going. We'll go to the second image.
Again, probably a good idea that I give you a chance just to take this image in. <laughs> this is a really mysterious, fascinating painting, um, one that we've shown a great deal at the museum. Um, and somewhat atypical for still at this time is that this is essentially a landscape. Uh, we have a few other paintings from this period. I believe this painting, uh, which is 297, PH 297, is from 1938, so just a little later than those farm subjects, but uh, more or less the same, uh, same period. He's still in Pullman at this time. Um, so it's interesting that he's deciding to show us the landscape of that same uh, period, or at least implied period. And what you start to see as you look at this painting are a number of things. First of all, if you've looked at enough of Still's landscapes in the mid-30s, they all have the same kind of nocturnal, almost twilight effect in terms of the uh, time of day and the coloration. Um, there's a sense of rising heat coming up from the ground, uh, but they never seem like bright, bright sunlight or, or, the, or high noon like it is here in Denver right now. There's always this sense, something we associate with uh, European surrealism, that sense of uh, almost like dreamscape, that these happen in this in-between time between lightness and dark uh, when uh, dreams or early dreams start to come in and your imagination can go uh, a little bit wild. And I think that's not an insignificant background when we start to unpack this image a little bit further. So we know that still um, growing up in and around Spokane, Spokane, Washington, the Cooley Dam, um, of course, getting up into Southern Alberta, Canada, he was familiar with the topography, the landscape, um, and certainly something called the Drum Heller Badlands. They had their uh, own area that was formed by water and erosion and time. And so sandstone rock formations, such as the large brown figure in the center area of this picture, would have been somewhat common, um, not necessarily a common subject for painters, but we shouldn't be so surprised to see that. Um, what is mysterious, though, is that they seem to be protected by some kind of barbed wire or barbed wire that has uh, gone loose from its pole. And that creates a kind of um, almost containment in these images that seems somewhat unusual given badlands are usually unbridled and, and very much open to nature. Um, but probably the most of the confusing aspects of this picture is when we start to focus on the second form. Um, we might assume that it's another sandstone monument, but if you know anything about geology, uh, there's nothing that would explain its white color. And certainly, and it could be chalk in another part of the universe, but certainly not up in this region. Um, and certainly immediately next to that other hoodoo, as they're often called, these sandstone monuments um, that rise up from the, the, from the ground. And so now when we see this, we start to realize we're in the realm of imagination, is that this isn't a picture of something that is um, absolutely seen in his uh, era, area, but something that is more interpretive and more open-ended. Um, I would even challenge you, if you haven't noticed already, that this appears more like a bone fragment um, ground into the earth, that it's st standing up somewhat uh, tall, but certain um, you know, joint elements here. And if, we start to, uh, if you start to believe me that these are, in fact, anthropomorphic based on um, humans or animals, uh, zoologic in that sense, then it throws into question what the other form is as well. And if you look again fairly closely, to my eye, and again, still never wrote about these pictures. They were never shown particularly often, um, if at all, during his lifetime. So this is purely my own reading of this rather baffling image, is that that sandstone element also looks rather uh, mask-like or skull-like, particularly if you think of the open element here as being the area where the eye socket uh, would be, and then even a suggestion of a mouth or um, opening at the lower end as well. So now we're sort of confused in this kind of back and forth flip-flop of is this uh, landscape, is it figuration, and I would argue it's uh, a little bit of both. I would also mention for our adult uh, audience that there's something um, overtly phallic about this image too, but I won't dwell on that over the lunch hour. Uh, we'll move quickly away from that. Um, the last part I want to bring your attention to is in the clouds, in the sky itself. Um, and again, a rather conventional treatment for still style at that time. There is this strange kind of bloom happening. Something seems to be growing or lifting or rising from these clouds, something that's organic, 
plant life, not something that is based in um, the meteorological world, for example. And so I will leave you with that image really as a sense that these are in fact kind of related to the world of irrationality, not necessarily the way um, uh, many artists were interested in Freud and the interpretation of dreams or other um, psychoanalytic approaches, but there's something about these images that do seem to be a compendium of images and sources to create what I think still was always interested in is to create an image that's compelling and warrants repeated viewing. Um, lastly, you may know from some of the exhibitions we've done here that there are two versions of many of Still's work and there are two versions of this painting. The other painting we were able to borrow back for an exhibition we did called Re, uh, Pete, Recreate. And strangely that, that uh, lotus-like or that floral element does not appear in the replica. And there's other stylistic differences as well. And so when you think of the reasons why Still would make different versions of the uh, same picture, um, that's a pretty ex a strong example of how certain uh, elements were included or excluded from subsequent versions. Um, a really interesting painting. It's only, as you can see, if my hands are in the picture, it's only probably about 30 inches tall, um, but it yields a lot of really careful viewing and is, again, a painting that we have shown often. Keep going, Nicole. So we're marching through time pretty slowly. We're just to about 1938. I'll take a little bit of time just so we can get this image in a little bit more carefully. But hopefully you can tell, um, like we often do at the museum, we are on a, a road towards an increasing degree of abstraction and interpretation. I'm gonna close these a little bit and see if we can get a little better light on it. So this painting is actually in the mid 40s, it's PH. 255 from 1944. And again, it's a painting we haven't shown very often. My guess is maybe only once or twice. Um, and as you start to look at it, as always in that kind of inquiry <laughs> when talking about works of art, um, I don't have you in the room with me to ask you these questions, but it's very interesting to consider what you see first and what, what strikes you. Um, for me, it's that, first of all, the color. I would describe it as kind of a denim blue, something that you do see in the overalls and a color that seems to pervade a lot of Stills farm pictures. Um, and in this case, it's more dispersed and sort of flayed out across this very large canvas. If I'm in the frame, you can see that this is a large painting um, uh, for any painter uh, working at that time or since. Um, if you start to read the image from left to right, a number of uh, objects and elements to me start to become apparent. But again, these are what uh, I see in these pictures based on looking at other paintings, other drawings, other photographs that still made. Um, and I think in many cases, I'm, I'm pretty close. If, you, if I won't say I'm 100% on, um, I think I'm pretty close in calling out some of the things that seem to be more representational. Um, so starting from the left, I believe these are two handles from a piece of farm machinery, probably a plow. Um, that other element is the cross member. Um, so that seems to be leading us into the painting from the left hand side. Um, where we're then met with to, what to me looks so clearly like an arm um, or what's left of the body. All we have is this arm from about the shoulder and the elbow probably right about here. And then strangely, it either ends up as a, an approximation of a hand stuck into the bottom of the paint, almost stuck into the ground. And again, if you looked at enough of the farm paintings, both the paintings and the drawings, a lot of times feet and hands are really heavily weighted um, toward the bottom edge of the painting. Um, equally possible, though, is that hand is in fact a shovel or a spade. And so that we're starting to see what's common in Stills' work at this time this idea of a transformation, what starts out as human becomes mechanical. Um, sometimes we call that uh, mechanomorphic, the idea of machine-like forms. Um, and once we have that locked in, then that's what starts to become pretty apparent, I think, throughout the painting. Um, other areas that start to become apparent to me, uh, I guess continuing left to right, anytime we see these repeated bands or patterns, um, they seem to be related to the rib cage or the muscular or, or um, skeletal structure of humans or animals. 
Um, so I think there's also an aspect of the seen world that we see at the lower left. Um, by the time you get to the right hand corner, I quite clearly see a man, probably a farm worker in coveralls again, the blue, um, moving that whole image forward, sort of pushing toward the center of the painting as if he's in a, a, a middle of a step, uh, kind of like Rodin steps or those great um, classical sculptural forms of figures in motion. But again, frustratingly, what happens as you start to carry that up and maybe you start to see the figure move this way, it becomes some sort of hook or machine-like element or uh, maybe something as simple as a barn uh, latch. Uh, and so again, this idea of a mechanomorphic quality um, coming through. Whether or not these are wing-like forms or um, what is often thought of as like the figure just being splayed or flayed open, uh, I think is open to any interpretation. Um, but I also see what starts to happen at the middle of the painting is this area here, which seems to be more of an interior space. Um, it's, it's not um, expressed so much externally as an interior world. I might even suggest um, uh, uh, uterus or, or fallopian tube even, that it has that kind of same organic um, anthropomorphic quality. And then when you back out from the picture again, it's quite remarkable how still makes a major composition, you know, roughly five by seven feet, um, filling up the entire uh, background of this sort of windswept sand um, storm, if you will, farm-like uh, background in what's a really interesting, really curious painting, but one that I think provides a lot of clues and um, points of departure when we start to see the work that is more abstract, uh, that is probably even more familiar to you. Uh, a foot here too, they just keep popping out from everywhere. What do you see? Thank God we have a question. <laughs> Slow me down a little. Uh, well, people are, are loving this because they've never seen it before. So we're getting some <laughs> feedback on that. Um, and there's a question from Richard. He asked, did Clifford still experience a dust bowl storm? Painting suggests that. They can hear your question, right, Nicole? I don't have to repeat it. Yeah. So dust bowls. I mean, we know my um, esteemed colleague, David Anfam, who did his dissertation on still, um, went so far as to look at climactic records of more so the teens in the areas where Stills family was farming. Um, and we know certainly during the depression years and probably after, even in our own uh, sort of uh, plains and Rocky Mountain region, dust storms, especially during droughts, we're living through a drought in Colorado right now for those of you outside of the state, um, I think this would have been something he would have been um, very familiar with and probably experienced dust storms, dirt devils of some um, type during his life, although I don't have any place where I can point to him ever recalling it. But certainly it would have been a phenomenon um, growing up in the plains of Eastern Washington State and certainly up in Alberta. Um, that would have been pretty conceivable, I think. Good question. Um, if there's nothing else, we're going to go a little bit um, in a different tact here. And instead of showing you individual paintings, as you will see, if you come to the museum, I guess I'll pull this all the way out. If you come to the museum uh, with a mask and with advanced tickets, <laughs> we are open to the public. We have been since July 1st. Um, you'll see something close to this in the fourth gallery of the museum where we're showing a number of paintings of the same time period, uh, what is often called salon style, because it's the way they showed paintings in the um, 19th century salons with uh, stacked paintings and getting all the entrance in on one wall. Um, these are all pictures from around 1942 to roughly 1945, about the same time period that uh, would be in the gallery on view uh, right now. Um, and I would also tell you our uh, collections team has been very um, smart in the way they organize our storage vaults. Um, many, most museums, you have to be very sensitive to space and other considerations that these uh, racks were kind of curated. So when people who are doing research or even the staff is coming in to learn the pictures more, um, these paintings did not end up on this rack by accident. They're very much uh, joined because of some of their commonalities. Um, the other thing that I would tell you is this date range and these types of paintings, 1942, 43, 44, would have been exactly the kinds of paintings that still 
was showing people like Peggy Guggenheim in order to get into his first exhibition in New York, um, a group show uh, uh, in 1945. And then he was uh, honored with a one person show in 1946 at Peggy Guggenheim's Art of the Century Gallery. Um, this would have also been the kind of painting that Robert M Motherwell would have referred to um, in the 1960s, thinking back on those years in the mid 40s when they were all getting their first shows in New York. Um, R Motherwell said, um, of all of us still was the most original, a bolt out of the blue. Um, we were working through figures and still had none. Um, so as much as these are rather uh, puzzling paintings, I don't think the very, very best painting still ever made, um, they do represent a very unique um, idiom and particularly within American art because they have very little relationship to what had been going on in European modern art, especially before the Second World War, um, and particularly don't look uh, very much at all like Matisse and Picasso, the two reigning champions of um, European um, early, earlier modern art. If anything, still is probably closer to surrealism and especially the um, Spanish painter based mostly in Paris, uh, Juan Muro, because um, they had that more org organic biomorphic quality. Um, but what I start to notice first in these paintings are very simple profiles, um, very um, you know, unusual uh, shapes, mostly described in black and white paint, sometimes bare canvas, but most of this, if you don't see it on your screen or at home, most of these are white paint. So they're very deliberate forms and they have a kind of positive, negative, um, and again, this very strong sense of profiles, whatever he's he's depicting in these paintings stand out because they are the um, sort of opposite of the color value that they are next to. Um, certainly when you think of adjectives about what you see in these paintings, uh, verticality, linear, um, rising forms, all the things that we associate in Stills' work, probably until the rest of his career with only a few exceptions, um, and a rather limited palette. He's very interested in black and white, yellow, a little bit of green sometimes, a strange aqua blue um, here and there, but it's a very reduced palette compared to what we're going to see in the painting starting um, later in the 40s, around 1947, 48, when color becomes such an important component. Um, Mark Rothko, in a, in a reference, um, in a letter back in, uh, to Still, they were in constant communication at this time, Rothko actually stretched and um, installed Still's paintings at his first one-man show at Peggy Guggenheim's Art of the Century because Still was back in San Francisco getting things going at um, the California School of uh, Fine Arts, now called the San Francisco Art Institute. And Rothko described these as his worm paintings, um, these kind of living, <laughs> um, uh, what, what is a worm? I'm not even sure what, is it a reptile or a, someone help me quick chat box quickly, uh, but you get that sense of them living and rising, you know, worms as they sit at a flat plate of water uh, or other kind of reptilian, no longer human figures, but again, all still ne needs to do is to take those rising yellow forms and they stand in for you and me and, and uh, all time. Um, we have a question, thank God. Uh, this is from Grant. He wants to know, did most of uh, his painting in this time period have black backgrounds? I think of his later work as being light and airy and having bare canvas. Yeah, they, yeah and we're gonna, the last picture, the last stop, I'm, I want to pick up on that a little bit. Um, so the blacks are not as expressive. Um, they again seem to be more plainer. Um, not a lot of rich paint handling that we're going to see in the next image. But yes, these black backgrounds, and there's another, oh, 12 or 15 of them up in the gallery right, right now have um, almost all that same uh, quality of black. Not every single one now that I think about it, but this is rather typical. And I think it's borne out by um, what you see here. And you know, what is kind of a random rack? I could pull out another one. I'm ad-libbing now. And yeah, black's pretty, <laughs> black's pretty apparent in these paintings. That's another good rack for another uh, Into the Vault. <laughs> Invertebrates, thank you. Someone did uh, get it to us. And then, you know, lastly, I will just um, leave you with a few other suggestions. You know, the central figure of what seems to be um, three, you know, forms and some sort of um, conversation, a group of huddled figures even. Um, that little stringy white um, element to me reads like hair because I've seen it in 
um, other drawings and other quasi figural works of still possibly suggesting a female life force, um, if we can be so um, interpretive and so overt. Um, even suggestions of green, uh, if it were to have a color symbolism, it seems to be growing like the grass is coming up from the bottom. Um, so a lot of really, really rich um, imagery and things that you can start to unpack. And, and again, uh, rib cages and figures in dialogue that I think start to become really important when you look at the work of the 1940s and 1950s, the, um, the sort of pinnacle of the abstract expressionist movement. Invertebrae. <laughs> we got it. Any other questions, Nicole? How are we doing on time? Um, we're going to now go really to sort of the last stop. Yep. Roughly five or so years. Oh, we do have a question. We, uh, we'll give, give people a chance to just uh, take this image in. This one is PH. Uh, sorry, I don't have these as well. PH number 26 from 1951, an example that these are numbered um, in, in a sort of random order. This is the 26th one they got to when they were uh, conducting the inventory, uh, probably in the 1960s. Uh, go ahead. This is from Eric. He's wondering, are there connections to the Pieta composition that can be found in these later works? Well, you know, I guess if you mean like male, female, and they're in some sort of uh, embrace or dialogue, I think so. Although, again, its relevance to the Pieta may be a stretch. Um, but even using this painting as an example, and we're, we're sort of, I'll even jump to some of the last things I wanted to leave you with. Um, but like a lot of Still's work of this time, and this is really one of his best periods, um, 1950, 51, 52, uh, that's the same period to the right. I probably shouldn't um, mention things that are only in partial view, but he's really pulled it together here. Um, there, there's something so remarkable about these images. Um, I would even say, uh, and this is a funny thing for me to uh, suggest, but he just becomes a better painter. There's something about looking at what he did in the mid 40s and then looking at how uh, he moves paint around in the early 1950s and after he really started to understand, as did all of the abstract expressionists, um, how paint itself and how you mix it and how you apply it and how you uh, add things on top of it or not, um, that paint itself can be an important and really powerful communicator of emotion. Um, it doesn't have to take the form of a um, still life or a tree in a landscape, but just paint itself. And I think this is really important that paint itself is expressive. And once we acknowledge that, um, you don't need that much more in your paintings um, or us as viewers to accept if we learn to let the paint cast its spell and work its magic on us as viewers. Um, and so this question of, you know, what is it we're looking at here? Um, there is that stri striking uh, life, what we call lifeline, a vertical that attaches both the top and bottom edge of the painting, uh, one in uh, this wonderful Stillian red, and then a quite different lifeline that's in uh, white paint. It's actually not bare canvas. He deliberately used the edge of his knife to execute this very taut, very um, tight uh, lifeline. You know, it's almost a lifeline that's been pulled, um, and it seems very fragile. Um, I would even tell you these uh, very different lifelines are equally fragile to me. When you think about it, if you think of gravity and weight and structural engineering, um, the weight of this thing is ready to collapse because it's veering out over its base. If you see a um, you know, stalactite or a, another natural form looking like this, it's going to tumble and fall over. Um, so there's something very tenuous about how he paints these images and that they seem somewhat fragile in a way. Um, ephemeral, I guess, would be another term for it. Um, and at the same time, uh, this is quite different from what we saw in the earlier up from the vault. Um, everything here seems kind of frozen too, very, very static, as opposed to some other images that may seem to be more um, eruptive or dynamic, um, gusts of wind creating arc. This thing looks very taut and very frozen. And any sort of sense you have of movement, implied movement, a conceptual movement, it's very, very subtle. 
Uh, and I think that's part of this, um, in French we call it the frisson, this idea of this moment um, that's being captured here that captivates us as uh, viewers because it does seem like something that is fleeting, although captured here um, in an oil painting. Uh, a question. Yeah, there was a, a lot of interest in the, the blue painting because it was one that people hadn't seen before. The previous one? Yes, uh -huh. and there is an interest in could, would you be willing to pull out another random rack <laughs> sure. featuring a painting that you don't think our visitors have seen before? Well, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. You know, I'm trying to think, uh, the only other um, aspect I want to say about this picture, and then we've got time, right? We've got a little time at the end. You can drop off the Zoom call if you're um, finding all this tedious. <laughs> um, but there's something else in these paintings that are a unique, stilly, and characteristic. Um, his colleagues didn't, um, didn't work this as much as Still did, but many painters in the 60s, 70s, and to this day, I think, do, uh, do benefit from some of the things that Still showed at them. And that is the way um, the edges, you can play with the very perimeter of the canvas. Um, this is an orange element that may not come out so well in your composition. Um, or even a little blue lifeline coming down from the top. Very delicate, very subtle. You'd have to go to our online co uh, collection to probably get a glimpse of it. Um, but it, again, it's kind of remarkable when you think of traditional painting. If you go to the very center of the painting, all that is there is his black paint, and I'm not complaining. <laughs> That's all you have there at the center. And any form, any um, you know, composition, is usually happening, not always at the periphery, but usually happening in some very unexpected places. And that too is part of the visual uh, dance, the visual excitement of looking at Still's work. And then our eye keeps moving about. I mean, this would be another good example because there's so much to look at. Um, and that could be applied to all the other abstract expressionists too. But no one um, toyed and played with the edges of paintings like Still did up until this point. Um, to such a degree that they do seem infinite, that that orange form exists in your mind, if not in another work of art, um, that extends beyond the parameters of the stretcher, um, and you don't need to see it to understand it, that it exists and it goes on even though it's out of your field of reference. Another question, I'm going to pull out a fun rack. <laughs> yeah, pull out a fun rack, but could, as you're pulling out the next rack, could you just do a, a really brief um, explanation of lifeline? Yeah, still, this is one of the few moments where we found the Holy Grail for Clifford Still in one of his, um, actually it was in an interview, so this has been known for some time, um, but Still did acknowledge the, um, the obvious vertical uh, emphasis in a lot of his painted forms, um, and he gave it a name, a lifeline. Um, in another uh, letter describing a different painting, he called it um, the human context. Um, so he's clearly, um, a, pointing us in the direction that these are not pictures about paint. Um, they are pictures about relevant ideas of humanity, the human condition, and um, probably the tenuous nature that that all um, implies as we march through the, you know, the universe of life. Um, another question. Yeah. Is it right here? Yeah, it's exactly what I said. I mean, it, it, it doesn't have any paint on the, um, on the canvas edge. So it isn't as though he decided to just wrap a larger canvas around. Um, that in his mind, this picture included this, um, what is in fact a yellow, uh, an orange form. And then it is, that's bare canvas, I think, on the right of it. Yeah, you have to look carefully because sometimes it's hard to say. So um, that's a very significant balancing part of creating his composition is what does the painting need? What, what um, would it take to make it complete? And that orange element was something that still felt was a vital component of the painting. And a very related question, are the canvases stretched and does the paint wrap around the No, edges? in this case it yeah. doesn't. And that's what's so fascinating about it. And, and almost all of these, um, we had some sense of where the tacking um, fold lines are. So we're not interpreting where those compositions start. My um, esteemed colleague, James Squires, is here with me today, and he has had to make decisions like this in every single painting that had to be stretched. You have to look at the um, prior exhibition history and, and what evidence is left uh, when either they were painted, because a lot of times that old mark would still um, be present in the canvas, or in other times when he stretched it and showed it. And in a few rare instances, we don't have that, 
and we need to interpret. We need to understand where that image ends. Uh, and this is not uncommon. We did a symposium at um, the Getty Center and Joan Mitchell's work, I think, had some of the same issues of not knowing where to stretch them when bare canvas and some of these incomplete forms um, appear. So these are, you know, some of the challenges, but some of the, um, the work, <laughs> some of the work we do here at museums that probably is not apparent to a lot of our visitors. Really great questions. So now we're going to do a, anyone have a lucky number between 40 and, uh, but in terms of things we've not shown, boy, that's, what's interesting is there's only about 100 paintings before the uh, breakthrough to abstraction. And so we've shown a lot of them, but let's just, let's see what we have here. Oh, these. We've shown all these, uh, believe it or not. These are, again, kind of transitional images. Um, some were made in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, certainly on the top row. Um, when he was helping in the war effort, 1941, 42, uh, uh, examining technical drawings for the ship welders. Um, he also used it as an opportunity to do sometimes fairly literal um, depictions of that work, and then others that are much more interpretive. Uh, like the hoodoo image that I showed you, these are very strange images Images and try to understand why all of these disparate forms would be hanging from cranes, um, some assuming images of like horse's head or um, again, crocodiles or things. Maybe they are all related to shipbuilding parts. Uh, but again, this is still making paintings and not necessarily describing everything that he saw in front of him. I'll pull out one and then some more uh, unusual paintings from around that same time, that sort of transition between figuration and abstraction. And these are particularly unusual because they don't necessarily go anywhere. They don't seem to be um, stepping stones to other things we see in the career. But what's so fantastic about the still collection is we have it all. So we see unusual, this is one of the more baffling paintings um, that looks like a grain elevator meets a knife blade meets um, God who knows what. Um, but a lot of these are very puzzling images that fill out, you know, what artists work on before they arrive, uh, if that's the right word, arrive at a kind of um, style that they become best known for. Good, uh, another good question. Hope that, that was, was fun. fun. Do you feel that the development of lifelines was born from the relationship between machines and people in the early 20th century? Uh, trains, factories, the smoke trails or roads? You know, if you've been to the museum, we almost always have these landscapes on view made in Alberta um, near a city called Killam. Uh, trains coming through the uh, barren prairies, um, grain elevators. We see those serpentine lines rising up from trains. I think it really starts as just a, you know, it's a compelling image. A straight line affects us one way, one that rides and moves in a more serpentine way affects us another way. Um, but I think, it, yeah, as you can see, as we work through the paintings from the later 30s and into 1940s, I think he was trying to retain um, that aspect of you and me. So how do I do that? You know, one could argue that in a lot of abstract art, um, squares or spheres or volumes, um, Brancusi sculpture, uh, human figuration is reduced to a very simple elemental shape. That's really what sort of modernism um, was about in a, in a certain respect. And I think still it is that same way. It's, it, it's what's left over from the figures and the landscape, um, but they embody a new spirit and a new visual vocabulary that was really quite unique to Still. Um, Barnett Newman will start to use um, vertical lines of a very different type, but in many cases for a similar uh, purpose that they, he wanted to represent uh, a kind of presence, human or otherwise spiritual uh, presence in the vast expanses of his large color field. So this, this is um, all to say that these paintings, not a painting in here, is really art for art's sake. It's all meant to be descriptive of something from the scene world, although he's not using representational art to, um, to show it. And even the scene world is probably a um, poor choice of words because it's things that we can only describe through abstraction. How do you make a picture of the force that keeps me alive um, and, and I'm screaming at you for 20 minutes? <laughs> uh, it, it's how do you, how, isn't abstract art the best tool to unlock these things that are mysterious from their very origin, and that is life itself. I think, I think we're running to a close. Um, thanks for staying with us. I, I know these are rather um, 
difficult to see the paintings if you've never been to our online collection before you now know of it. And it's a really wonderful tool if you want to um, zoom in and really see some of the things that we can see in person. And uh, don't forget that we are open to the public um, and uh, with tickets and masks and all the other safety protocols. But it's a wonderful time to come to the museum. Uh, only 16 people are allowed in an hour and you usually have the place almost to yourself. Um, so please come. Uh, we we're only open this week before we'll close to turn our exhibition around to reopen on September 18th. So thank you all very much. It's been fun. Um, and we'll see you all in the galleries very soon, I hope. Thank you, Dean. And thank you to all of you for participating today.